Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here in Boston, safe and sound with all of you. And uh, as Marge said, I'm going to talk about some simple steps that could improve the use, reporting, and interpretation of epidemiologic research. And one of the good things about going close to the end is that many of the points I've wanted, I want to make have already been made, so I will try to go through some of them quickly and just reemphasize some of the things that others have said. This is my disclosure slide. Um, and there's my email address. So I'm not going to read this to you. If anybody wants my slides, just email me and I will send you a copy of my slides. Here's an outline of what I'm going to discuss. I'm going to very, very briefly do a historical context, sort of what I will call a psychological context, and then talk about some specific challenges that I think we have that are not unique only to the field of epidemiology, but are perhaps particularly troublesome there at times and try to talk a little about what we might do about that. So here's the historical context. And the point I want to make is that the issues we're facing with of research integrity are not new. In fact, I would argue that, like most things, the world is much better today than it was years ago. So I sometimes hear people say, oh, in our modern world, research isn't like it used to be, where we all had integrity. We didn't all have integrity a long time ago. So Gregor Mendel, it's very clear, fudged his data. Um, Sir Ronald Fisher is one of the people who actually figured that out. Um, the Punnett squares he presented are too close to the expectations to have occurred by chance. Uh, Louis Pasteur also fudged some data, as well as did a lot of things that would never get past any ethics board today. Um, Sir Cyril Burt, there's a lot of controversy about this, but it's fairly clear that he, uh, or widely believed that he fabricated some IQ data. Uh, Dominique Cassini had a, someone who today we would call a postdoc, Ole Romer. Romer figured out that the speed of light was finite had a, a way of proving it by seeing when a certain moon came around a certain planet. He predicted it. His prediction was in contrast to his mentor Cassini's prediction. Uh, Romer was correct. And when the moon came out at exactly the time that he said, then his mentor and everybody who backed the older man said, oh, we never predicted that. No, 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 you have it wrong. And his results were suppressed until essentially the uh, mentor died. And then Romer, the Danish scientist, was given credit for showing that the speed of light was finite. Uh, in mathematics, sometimes you hear people say, no one fights wars in mathematics. Not at all true. Um, Leopold Kronecker attempted uh, viciously to suppress the work of Cantor on infinities. And so we have these ad hominem attacks. And then perhaps, you know, even the great Sir Isaac, one of pro probably the three greatest geniuses of all of science, in corresponding with Leibniz about the calculus, wrote in a letter, his second letter to Leibniz said, because I cannot proceed with the explanation of it now, I have preferred to conceal it thus. And he put this little anagram in there. So it's a little code that he could use to show that in fact he had the calculus later, but I'm not gonna tell you about it now. So it wasn't all nice and sharing and friends and honesty back in the old days either. This is the nature of human beings. And that leads to the next part, the psychological context. I think there's a tendency to think that the only concerns in research integrity have to do with financial connections. The research integrity problems have to do with the fact that research is done by humans, and humans are imperfect, and all humans have interests. And those interests create sometimes conflicts, even conflicts they don't realize. So consider this question. Which would you rather stand closer to? chocolate or dog feces? Now this seems to be a rather obvious question and I think most people would say, given a choice, I will stand closer to chocolate than dog feces. That's certainly what I would guess. And here comes from a paper which actually studied this. And I remember in their pretest, it's one of the, most, the greatest lines I've read in a, in a paper in which it says, um, in our pretesting we have confirmed that people prefer chocolate to dog feces. I thought, that's great that we, did a study to figure that out. But that was just their pretest. And here's the results. So they actually had a table, and the table had an object on it, and they had shown people some tape marks on a wall that were about 90 inches apart. And then they said that down on that table over there, there was an object, and one time the object was chocolate. And they said, okay, we want you to stand as far away from the table as you think those marks are. And that's how far people stood away, a little over 100. 
inches. And then another case was dog feces. And the people were told, we want you to stand that far, as you know, this is the target, we want you to stand that far away. And they stand closer. What's going on? Well, it turns out, after a lot of careful testing, that people see objects that are desired as closer than objects that are less desired. And this is very consistent. And so it's a bias. It's not a bias due to financial conflicts. It's not a bias that people are even aware of and probably most of us wouldn't even predict. I would not have predicted this in advance, but after the careful study, it makes sense. So this shows that we're all human, we all have biases, and so we've got to accept that and try to figure out ways to get around it, and that's really what science is. So what are some of the biases that, that come into play? What are some things that lead us to have erroneous beliefs, to believe in myths and presumptions as though they're facts and so on in the fields of obesity and nutrition? Well, one is the inappropriate use of causal language. So this is the use of causal language in observational studies in nutrition and obesity from a paper my colleagues and I published in four different journals. You see actually quite a bit of variation. These are a few years old. They may have changed since then. Quite a bit of variation from journal to journal. But even in, in the journal of the four we looked at that was the best, you're dealing with about 15% of observational studies using language that implies they've demonstrated causation. And in Journal of Nutrition, it was more than 50%. So this is a big problem. What can we do about it? Well, here's some journal editors that came out recently with a statement about how they want language to be used. So they said, let's give people some very concrete things. So if you're doing a randomized trial, you can say X reduced the risk by. If you're doing an observational study, you should say a lower risk was observed, or there is a relationship, or there is an association, and so on. And so these can be converted into checklists, just like we have pilots use checklists before they take the plane off, just like we have surgeons use checklists to make sure they've done all the right thing in the surgery and didn't leave a sponge inside somebody. We can have journal editors and reviewers start to use checklists, and we would be wise to do so, and build those things into checklists. Well, where else might distortions occur? Sometimes it's not just the peer-reviewed journal, it's the press release. And again, remember, think about this for a minute. Think about if you're the editor of Cooking Light magazine or Allure magazine, or for that matter, perhaps even uh, the New York Times. And in some cases, if you're a writer, you may have very little, if any, scientific training. You're on deadline, and what comes out is a press release. And so, you're going to write from the press release. You're not going to have the time or the ability, in many cases, to read that whole paper. So let's take a look at some things here. So this is an article that came out. This is just one example. The, the example I'm giving is not any worse than 100 other examples that you and I could find. This is a paper that came out about a year ago. And here's what it says in the results paper, uh, uh, section of the peer review paper. Changes in rates for obesity, this was an obesity prevention school-based kind of program, for the intervention school were similar to those seen in the control school. That's a nice way of saying, we got nothing. We tried it, it didn't work. Okay, that's enough, no shame in that. That's why we try things, to figure it out. Here's the press release. Kaiser Permanente study finds students eat healthier when school-based nutrition programs involve teachers, staff, and parents. Tailored programs could reduce obesity. But wait a minute, there was no effect on obesity. Now, if you read down into the ninth paragraph of the press release, it states, although researchers hypothesized that the school environment policy changes would reduce childhood obesity rates, no changes were observed. And that seems a little disingenuous, don't you think, to write, Taylor programs could reduce obesity? And then they go on to explain, of course, why their hypothesis um, was in fact right all along and they just did the wrong study. Why can't we just say at the end, I had a hypothesis, I tested it, didn't work, move on. Anyway, so this is a big problem with distortion of press releases. You can see other examples and, and quantitative studies in these references. Now, what can we do about it? Well, the First Amendment of the United States guarantees, among other things, freedom of speech. And so we can't tell people you can't release your own press release and say what you want in it. But what we could do is release press releases from the journal. And the journal could say this press release has been peer reviewed. It wasn't prepared by the authors. It wasn't prepared by the author's institution. It was prepared by the journal. And it was sent out to the reviewers. 
and it could have a little seal on it that says this is a peer-reviewed press release. And now the journalists who have perhaps limited time and expertise can go through and say, is this press release peer-reviewed or not? And so I've noticed that many journalists have learned to ask, is this study peer-reviewed? They understand that. So if we give them their checklist, they can work with those two. And one checklist can be, are you using a peer-reviewed press release? And so that's something we may want to consider. Now, there's also a lot of analytic fiddling and bungling, and we've heard some examples of some of that. Um, I've bungled a lot of statistical analyses in my career, and I think it's very important to have a very high level of checking, and that's not easy. But let's also talk about some fiddling here. This is not an example of bungling. So a lot of people did a good job of talking to you about p-values. P-values are random variables. When the null hypothesis is true, meaning there's nothing to find, then the distribution of p-values is what's called a uniform or rectangular distribution. If you simulated a bunch, as I did here, you'd get something that looks like a rectangle. Here's zero, here's one, with a little bit of statistical noise. Now, in contrast, if there is something to find, meaning the null hypothesis is false, okay, what you get is this monotonic increasing, or really monotonic decreasing, I should say, curve here, that as you go from zero to one, it goes down. And that's, it has to be that way. That's a mathematical fact. It can't change directions, right? It's got to only go in this direction apart from random variability. Now, I did a little simulation where what I did is this. Imagine that you're a graduate student, and you're working with me, and you come, and uh, I've given you the data to analyze on the project that we've just spent five years working on and $5 million of taxpayer money to study the effects of X on Y. And we've finally been waiting and waiting. The results are in. The data are in. I say, go analyze the data come back and tell me what you get. And you come back and you say, Professor Allison, the p-value is 0 0.056. 0 0.056? We spent five years and $5 million on this? 0 0.056? I think you should go back to your cubicle and check the data a little bit more. Maybe you overlooked something. Maybe it's not quite normally distributed, and perhaps you should consider a non-parametric test. Maybe some non-transformations might work. And what happens then is the student goes and keeps hitting it with different statistical analyses until he gets something that crosses the border of the 05. And if you get that, what happens is you get that little dip. And that's the simulation. So I had some students actually take 347 abstracts from PubMed on randomized controlled trials of obesity. And I said, go and write down the first p-value in the abstract. I don't know if that was really the right way to do it or not. I couldn't figure out how to get the right p-value. So I said, just write down the first p-value. And then I took them, and I compiled them. And here's the thing. Look at that little hole there, and there's that little hole. Oh my goodness, what's going on? Now, if there's a god, he's got a sense of humor. Because look at the p-value for the dip. It's 0.052. <laughs> so I can't declare that it was significant. And I resisted the urge to fiddle with it and make it significant. Um, we, Gary Gadber and I published a paper on this methodology in PLOS once as a methodology for detecting these kind of things. But these kind of things happen. So what can we do to minimize these? Well, one is we should have public disclosure of data analysis, analysis plans before publication. So just as with randomized controlled trials, now we've gotten to the point that we didn't have 10 years ago where you've got to register your trial in advance in clinicaltrials.gov, how about registering the analytic plan? If you read those things in clinicaltrials.gov, there's actually not a lot of information there. Now we need to get the information better. So if you registered your analytic plan and you said, my covariates are going to be X1, X2, and X3, and then when your paper shows up in the literature and the covariates include X4 and X5 and not X1, X2, and X3, then I think we have a right to say, what's going on? Why aren't you using your analytic plan? Was there some fiddling there? I think we've got to make the, public, uh, the raw data publicly available, as Stan Young said earlier. Now, I have to say that as a statistician, as someone who likes to do these kinds of things, I really want everybody else's raw data to be available. As someone who also generates raw data, my nightmare is an email from Stan Young who says, David, could you please send me the raw data on your recent publication? I have some questions. Oh, my God. And it's not because I've made the data up and I've cheated. It's because the likelihood 
that somebody made an honest mistake along the way, or that I will pull up the wrong version of the data file, or that I will have bad documentation and Stan is now going to harangue me with questions for the next six months on what this variable means and how did I collect it, and I, I want to move on. I'm done with that paper, Stan. I already published it. I don't want to answer your questions anymore. I understand how unpleasant that is. And so I think we really need to take this seriously to say we, we've got to get there, but we also have to think of the investigator's point of view. It's not easy to get there, and we need to put some resources behind that. All right, and we've got to build in uh, the expectations and the resources for this kind of sharing and checking. I have a recent paper which we've just submitted in which we're looking at some very complex sort of modeling of assortative mating and differential reproduction and how that affects BMI distributions. And I got a result that I didn't think made sense. And it was like Bob Matthews sort of, you know, unbiased uh, thing. You know, my prior was the results got to be in that direction, and yet it wasn't. And I just kept saying, it can't be right, it can't be right, it can't be right. And I kept sending that postdoc back, check it again, check it again, check it again. And we couldn't find anything wrong. So I finally sent this out to about eight different colleagues around the country, around the world. And I said to these guys, hit this thing, do me a favor, look at this paper, hit it with everything you got, find what we did wrong. I can't find a mistake. Can you find a mistake? We sent them the data, we sent them the code, we sent them the manuscript. These were not chumps. These are some of the top guys in the world who work in this area. Seven out of eight said, can't find anything. The eighth guy said, I got it. And the eighth guy found a mistake. And we fixed that. But you think about the resources that took to do that. A lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of brain power in that, and an expectation that that was a reasonable thing to do. And of course, you probably have also detected the bias. I wouldn't have sent it out if I got the result I expected. Okay, undisclosed multiple testing, big problem, Stan hit it well, so I'm not going to address it anymore. Okay, not knowing when to stop. This is one of my pet peeves in the field of epidemiology. Let me show you what I mean by that. There's something in psychology called the mere exposure effect. It was described this way by the Nobel Prize winning economist Daniel Kahneman in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Kahneman wrote, a reliable way to make people believe in falsehoods is frequent repetition, because familiarity is not easily distinguished from truth. Authoritarian institutions and marketers have always known this fact. You do not have to repeat the entire statement of a fact or an idea to make it appear true. People who were repeatedly exposed, for example, to the phrase, the body temperature of a chicken, were more likely to accept as true the statement that the body temperature of a chicken is 144 degrees. By the way, the body temperature of a chicken is not 144 degrees. I checked the USDA website, unless you cook it. Um, but alive, it's much less. Um, but they're more likely to believe this if they've just heard that phrase over and over. So why do I bring this out? Well, Andrew Young, who's actually going to present on this here at EB, is a postdoc working with me, and what he did is he went back to the peer-reviewed literature, the Association Epidemiologic Studies, of breakfast consumption, or skipping breakfast, I should say, and the risk of obesity. And what he finds is when the first couple of studies come out, the odds ratio is about 1.7 or so. And the confidence interval just barely misses one. So Robert Matthews would say, hey, you know, I'm very skeptical of this, this is not so credible, and so forth, so maybe do some replication. Okay, that's a good idea. And so some replications occur, and now it starts to look more credible. Those confidence intervals come in. Interestingly, the point estimate doesn't change very much. And here's the p-value we've plotted in red. This is the minus log of the p-value. And at this point, the p-value is about 10 to the minus 3. Now at that point, you might say, I'm pretty much convinced. Soon, we should probably stop doing more of these studies, and yet they keep going and going. They come out every few weeks. You see another one, breakfast consumption, risk of obesity. The p-value, when we stopped counting as of about a year ago, is um, 10 to the minus 42 when we meta-analyze it all. We're starting to approach the inverse of the number of protons in the universe, according to Eddington's number. <laughs> All right, so we could stop, we could have stopped here a long time ago. Why are we continuing to spend resources on this? Well, I don't know why, that's a big problem right there. We should spend our resources differently. But what we're doing is we're doing research that increases belief because of the mere exposure effect without increasing knowledge. 
So what's the proposed solution to this? Without creating publication bias, that is, we don't want to suppress things and say you can't publish your results, we need to more effectively limit the rewards for minimally informative research. At some point, we need to say, you know what, stop doing that kind of research. We're not going to reward it anymore. We're not going to forbid it. We're not going to refuse to publish it. But we're not going to reward it so that the resources go elsewhere and we don't increase belief without increasing evidence. What about publication bias? Here's an example of distortion. This is, uh, imagine here, odds ratio or log odds ratio. Here's a statistical weight. Um, more precise studies are up here, less precise, smaller studies are down here. What you see is this is simulated data, kind of an upside down funnel. That's why these are called funnel plots. Big studies give precise information, very tightly clustered. Small studies give less precise information, way spread out. But what if you only publish the statistically significant ones? Then you would get only the black dots being published in this example, or you are more, pro more likely to publish them. So look at that pattern of the black dots in these simulated data. This is from the World Health Organization's report on breastfeeding and obesity association studies. Look at that, those black dots, look at those black dots. Son of a gun, that's the same pattern. These are real data, all right? So where are all the dots over here? Why isn't this a funnel that's nice and symmetrical? Why? Almost certainly publication bias. People are publishing what's significant and not publishing what's not significant. So what's the way to deal with that? I think what we need to have is mandatory publication for all studies done at nonprofit institutions. Nonprofit institutions deserve nonprofit status because they fulfill a public mission. That mission is to advance knowledge. You don't advance knowledge by stuffing papers in your file drawers and forgetting about them. You advance knowledge by publishing those papers, getting that information out there. So I think we need to say to institutions, if you're going to maintain a nonprofit status and have your investigators work on projects, those projects need to be made public. If you're going to take human subjects and expose them to risks, they need to know that their efforts are being rewarded by that information being public, and so on and so forth. And I think this can be as simple if people say, I don't want to waste my time trying to get a null, boring finding in the journals. Fine. Publish it on a website. Put a technical report on your university website. We're long past the days of everything having to be in print. Anybody can put up a technical report on their website for essentially zero cost, but the information has to get out there. Reporting bias. This doesn't mean that the results here are wrong, but that what we choose to report and how we choose to report it can lead to biases. Here's an example from a paper. The paper was published in American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, but very nicely we have the clinicaltrials.gov now. So you can go back for that randomized trial and say, what was it? How is it portrayed when they first entered it? In clinicaltrials.gov, the title of the trial is Effect of Carbonated Soft Drinks on the Body Weight. And the primary outcome measure listed first is body weight, is listed by the authors. But here's the paper coming out in AJCN. The title of the paper now is Sucrose Sweetened Beverages Increase Fat Storage in the Liver, Muscle, and Visceral Fat Depot, a six-month randomized intervention study. Well, the consort guidelines tell us that we're supposed to put the primary endpoint in the title of the paper when we publish. And AJCN is supposed to adhere to those guidelines, but something fell through the cracks here. Now, this result isn't wrong, but it gives a very different picture than you might have gotten if you had read this paper and it said, sucrose-sweetened beverages have no effect on weight or total body fat, and in secondary analyses we found blah, blah, blah. All right? Gives a very different uh, review. Here, they say in their methods, our main aim was to test the hypothesis that sucrose sweetened beverage increase ectopic fat. That's their main aim, right? That's their words. But here, it says the primary outcome was body weight. In the results, they show that there was no significant uh, changes in body weight or fat mass. You've got to go all the way to the results section to find it. That's reporting bias. And what we need to do is empower the journals with resources to go back to be able to maintain these standards of conduct. We need to be able to instill in people a sense that there are standards of conduct. conduct. Then we need to uh, have study registries include the analytic plan, and we need to provide the journals with resources for checking. Measurement error. Kevin Dodd and Dr. Tucker did a great job on this. I'm not going to belabor it. Measurement error is a big problem, especially when we talk about dietary, uh, excuse me, about energy intake. Here's from a letter in which we pointed out some, some uh, claims that an author made based on self-reported energy intake as, early, as late as 2011, or excuse me, 2012. 
that we think just are totally implausible. What are we going to do about this? I think Professor Dodd and Tucker were actually very generous and easygoing. Uh, I was going to propose a 12-step uh, approach to help uh, nutrition epidemiologists, but that would require that you be able to count to 12. So I thought we'd just go with a three-step program. The first step is you got to admit you have a problem. So a lot of the people in the field of nutrition epidemiology don't want to admit how bad it is. It's bad. All right, and I think we saw some examples of that. And it's especially bad when we talk about energy intake, where we know it's not just random error, but there are systematic and large biases. Second is get help. Um, and actually, it's from the same website Kevin Dodd pointed out. Uh, here's Ray Carroll's talk, a particularly nice one. And the third is just say no. So sometimes you hear the argument, well, self-report is the best way we have of measuring energy intake, and other things, other aspects of diet in large populations. We don't have a better way. And I said, well, that's OK. That doesn't mean this way is good enough. Maybe we're just not ready to study this. Maybe we need to take back all that money that we're giving to people to do all these self-report dietary intakes and say, take that money and give it to some physicists, no conflict of interest, I'm not a physicist, and say, take the, let those physicists and engineers and so on go and develop a method that really works to actually measure food intake in people. All right, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this. It's just to say people often incorrectly cite papers as showing, saying they show what they don't in fact show. Um, we need to give journals the resources to do better checking on this. All right, so in conclusion, what can we do that will plausibly help and actually accords with our discipline of science. We've put too much emphasis on trying to find the pure souls. Somehow that disclosure will allow us to figure out who's naughty and who's nice. And then we will, in fact, say, these are the people we trust, and these are the people we don't trust. The American Statistical Association has a nice little saying I like, in God we trust, all others bring data. It's the data that matter, OK? And so as scientists, we can't be looking for pure souls. What I think we need to do is try in training to emphasize that science is a discipline and a vocation, not just a job. It's a special calling in which you have an obligation to truthfulness above all else. Then we need to develop a set of meta-methods, these kinds of checking, registries, pre-documentation pre of data analysis plan, public depositing of data, public depositing of protocols, and so on which collectively will buttress and ensure the implementation of the fundamental scientific methods that already exist. But we have to recognize that doing so is not cheap, and it's not easy, and we need to bite the financial bullet and put resources in place to implement those meta-methods. And in the words of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, let us take this path through the woods. Thank you. <laughs>